Good morning. How's everybody doing today? Cool. My name is Javier, and I am here today to talk to you about um, time in our systems, specifically the timekeeping mechanisms they use. Now, first things first, what even is time, man? <laughs> I kid, we're not going to go down that path today, but I'm happy to talk physics and philosophy some other day, preferably over red wine. Um, for our purposes today, um, our intuitive notions of time will suffice, namely that it moves forwards, uh, we use it to sequence events and to make measurements. Now, we use time extensively in our systems, right? You don't need me to stand here and tell you this. But rarely do we think about the underlying timekeeping mechanisms at play. What do I mean? Well, here's an example. Say we have a simple distributed key value store. Everybody here familiar with the idea of a distributed database? Cool. Um, so we have three nodes, and we're going to assume that there are no failures and all our operations succeed. Now say I come along and I put key equal to V. Uh, a few seconds later, I change my mind and I put key is equal to V2. Then you come along and you perform a get for key. What's the value you get here? It's V2, right? Any takers for V1? <laughs> nice. So the final value you get depends on the consistency model um, of the data store. Are we using MySQL or are we using Cassandra? And I haven't told you anything about the consistency model. But wait a minute. This talk was supposed to be about time and timekeeping. Why are we talking about consistency models? Well. A consistency model can be thought of as the set of guarantees the system provides about what events are visible and when. So it's about time in that the consistency model encapsulates the set of valid timelines for events in our system. And these guarantees, they are informed by and, and enforced by the timekeeping mechanisms the system uses. So this is what we're interested in today, what these mechanisms are, uh, and how they affect the properties of the system. The rest of this talk is structured as follows. Um, I will first talk about computer clocks in physical time. Uh, we'll then talk about other timekeeping mechanisms in the context of Spanner and React to practical systems. Um, and finally, we'll take a step back and wrap up. All right then, first things first, computer clocks. So let's first concretize the model we're working with, right? It's a distributed data store, um, which means it's a data store spread out over several nodes, um, where the, uh, the features we care about a node is that each node operates sequentially, and our nodes are separated in that there's no shared memory, they are separated by a network, and they communicate um, over by shared, uh, sorry, by message passing. Um, now, the reason we want to use a distributed store is for properties like fault tolerance and scalability for performance, which means our data is partitioned across these nodes and uh, replicated. Okay, so this is the model we're interested in. And our question is, given this is our system, how do we keep time across it? Well, let's see. Our computers have clocks. My computer has a clock. Can we just use them? The party line answers to, these quest to this question goes like this, right? Hardware clocks drift. NTP, man, I tell you, NTP. Uh, the system clock, it keeps Unix time. But what are the real problems with this? What are the properties we want from our timekeeping mechanism that these don't provide? Um, to answer that question, we're going to delve into the system clock and units time to see how they work. An uh, important caveat we, uh, before we begin, the details vary by pretty much everything, uh, but, we don't, but the details don't matter today. We're after the, the higher level concepts and those remain uh, pretty much the same. Uh, that said, that's what we will be assuming, a Linux running on an x86 processor. Okay. So let's start with the first, hardware clocks drift. Um, now, what is this hardware and why does it matter? Uh, starting from the top, when you run a command like date or call something like time.now to get the time from your favorite programming language, uh, 
This translates to a system call to get the value of a particular computer clock. Right? Now we have different computer clocks. We have the system clock or the wall clock. This is the clock we're familiar with. It keeps Unix time. But there are other clocks. There's the monotonic clock, there's the monotonic raw clock, and there are others. Now all of these computer clocks are software based, but they are run by a hardware clock uh, or hardware clocks in conjunction with the operating system kernel. Um, Let's look at an example of how this works in practice using the system clock. So the system clock is simply a counter, right? And it's run by the hardware and the OS kernel. The way this works is at system boot, it's set to a value, to a reading based on uh, the hardware clock. The hardware clock is, is usually the real-time clock, which is a tiny chip on the motherboard. Um, and subsequently, this counter is maintained, it's incremented um, by the kernel arranging for a hardware ticker to deliver interrupts periodically, okay? Conceptually, this is like the kernel telling the HPET or a different ticker, a different timer, um, telling the HPET, hey, interrupt me in 10 milliseconds. So when the interrupt is delivered to it, the kernel knows that 10 milliseconds have passed and it increments the counter by that much. Now, modern, modern kernels, not so modern anymore, uh, but they're all tickless kernels, uh, which means that the interval, the interrupt interval is calculated dynamically. All right, pretty simple. So this is the system clock, and this is the hardware clocks that can drift. So when they drift, what it means that, what, what it means that is different computer clocks uh, change at different rates. So this is the real problem, that our clocks are not synchronized. Let's move on to the second. NTP man, NTP. Everybody here familiar with NTP? Okay, um, so it's basically a clock synchronization protocol. It tries to make it so, um, it tries to make it so our system clocks remain synchronized with a highly accurate clock network. And what's special about that clock network is um, the hardware that powers it are very accurate clocks, like GPS and atomic clocks that have minimal drift. Now the way it synchronizes our computer clocks, the system clocks, um, is it has two modes of operation. It can gradually increase or decrease that interrupt rate. This is called skewing the clock, and this is good. Or it can simply jump the clock. It can simply step it or set it to a new value. And this is bad because it means our clocks, the time they keep is or can be discontinuous. There are other problems with NTP. For one, you need these trusted and reachable NTP servers. Uh, and for, the, for another, NTP is slow. On the public internet, it can take up to hundreds of milliseconds, and this matters when you're trying to keep things consistent in a data store. And lastly, let's talk about the system clock. Uh, the system clock, which keeps Unix time. Now, we sort of know what Unix time is. Um, it's the number of seconds since Epic, which is some point in time defined with respect to the UTC time standard. The other property of Unix time is it, it counts, um, it calculates a day as having exactly 86,400 seconds. Okay, so if we wanted to know the thousandth day since Epic, we could simply do thousand times that 86,400 and that would give us Unix time. Seems pretty reasonable, except UTC days are not a constant 86,400 seconds. Um, wait, what? <laughs> Well, we're going to have to take a brief interlude to talk about UTC. I promise I'll keep it short. Um, the idea behind UTC is somewhat bewildering, right? It's this like messy compromise of a time standard between atomic time, which is kept by atomic clocks, and astronomical time, which was the old school way of calculating time based on the Earth's rotation. Why do we want a, a time standard in between the two? Well. They both have nice properties. Atomic clocks are very regular, very stable, um, but astronomical time has the nice property of matching up with the Earth's rotation, and I'm told that this is nice for certain, um, for certain aspects, like uh, navigation and, astrono and astronomy, um, unclear. Uh, but anyway, UTC, uh, so UTC decides to be based on atomic time, 
and periodically adjust its time to sync with the Earth's rotation. So far, it doesn't sound too bad either, until you learn that the Earth's rotation gradually slows down with time. Um, so over time, the Earth's and Earth day takes slowly longer than 86,400 seconds. And so to compensate for this drift, UTC does this remarkable thing of adding a second. Every now and then, um, typically at midnight, UTC inserts what is called a leap second, which you may have heard of. It caused a recent cloud flare outage that was quite large. Um, but how the leap second works is um, from going from 11.59.59, the time jumps to 11.59.60, and then goes to midnight. OK, end of interlude, back to you next time. So UTC um, can be either a UTC day can be either of these seconds long. But Unix time, kept by the system clock, doesn't know how to represent this extra second. But in the long run, we want our computer's idea of current time to keep up and remain aligned with UTC, right? We don't want it to have its own sense of what the time is. So what does Unix time do? Well, uh, in the case of a leap second, Unix time simply waits. It simply repeats a second. <laughs> which means the time kept by our system clock is not monotonic. So this is the real set of problems with using computer clocks. Um, computer clocks across different computers do not give us synchronized monotonic time. Why does this matter? Well, let's see with an example. Say we have two nodes. So all my representations in this talk are going to be space-time diagrams where uh, time moves from left to right. And our perspective of a node's timeline is represented by those horizontal lines. Um, and events against the system are going to be upwards and downwards arrows. OK? It's pretty standard. Uh, OK, so two nodes. Now say I come along and I put key is equal to v. But node one tends to, is, is unsynchronized. It's a fast node. So it timestamps it with 150. A few seconds later, I perform another put that ends up in node two. Um, I put keys equal to v2. But node two maybe has the right time, maybe it's slower, but it timestamps it with a lower version. So although I have a newer version of data, it's timestamped with an older timestamp. So not only is our system inconsistent now, we're pretty much done for it. Game over. We can never reconcile this um, inconsistency, right? Which is why. And that brings us to the need for other timekeeping mechanisms. Our systems need to provide abstractions on physical time as we know it in order to function correctly. So what are these other timekeeping mechanisms? Well. It depends. It depends on, as we alluded to in the beginning, the consistency model the system chooses to provide, what guarantees it wants to provide about how events will be ordered and when they will be visible. But this is not, this decision does not uh, have a single dimension, right? Uh, consistency comes with costs. Um, for one, you have availability costs. Right? Availability is the notion of, um, very informally, how responsive the system is. And typically, the, more, the higher consistency means lower availability. This is the cap theorem at play, sort of. Um, and consistency also has a, has a cost of performance. Right? And performance specifically means uh, read and write latency and therefore throughput of the system. Um, and so while building these systems, you typically have to make trade-offs. You have to turn down and up these knobs of consistency, availability, and performance. Um, so the timekeeping mechanism is also dependent on these three uh, factors. Now, this relation between the timekeeping mechanism and these properties of the system is something we'll come back to throughout the talk. For now, though, enough theoretical preluding. Um, Let's talk real systems. So the first system we're going to talk about today is a strongly consistent data store built by Google. It's called Spanner. Are people here familiar with or heard of Spanner? Uh, cool, nice. 
Um, so as you know then, Spanner is a distributed relational database. Um, it, uh, it allows for complex schemas and distributed transactions, which is pretty neat. Uh, now, Spanner is horizontally scalable, so your data, your savings table in a banking system may live on one partition and checking on another partition. Um, it's geo-replicated for fault tolerance, and Spanner really cares about being performant, right? And this is uh, an important design consideration to note. And finally, the consistency model Spanner uh, provides is a very strong form of consistency called external consistency. The definition is a mouthful. Uh, a globally consistent ordering of transaction that matches the observed commit order. To see what that means, let's just work through an example. Um, so say we have a spanner setup. Uh, we have our savings and our checkings on two partitions. Uh, each is replicated. And the application has a constraint that the minimum total balance requirement uh, for a user's account across their checkings and savings accounts must be 200. Now at the beginning of the world, my account meets that criteria. And then I perform a deposit into my savings account. This is the first transaction. Um, and then a few seconds or maybe a few hours later, um, I make a debit from my checking account. And this is T2. Now, what do we want from this system? Well, we want it to never be the case that T2, the debit, is visible, but not T1, the deposit, right? This is, this is, what, this is the essence captured by a globally consistent transaction order. Here, what we're saying here is T1 and T2 are transactions operating on different partitions of the key space, and yet, despite that, we want them uh, to be ordered in the order observed by me, external to the system, to the commit order that I observed. Now, why is this complicated, or why is this tricky? Well, imagine, the, imagine one partition is in the US. So T1 goes to the US partition, and T2, that partition is in Europe. So T2 ends up in the Europe data center. And um, the auditor for the bank, say the bank accounts balance police, um, is sitting in Europe and checking, um, checking balances meet that criteria. Now, you would think that if they hit the, data, the Europe data center, it's entirely possible that they, that they, they might see uh, T2 before T1. And we don't want that to be the case because then I would be in trouble and the system would be incorrect as per its spec. So that is the idea of external consistency. Okay, um, the other thing we care about is performance, right? You can imagine one way to provide external consistency by just putting a giant lock on the entire database. Um, but that would sort of defeat the purpose of a distributed database. Uh, so what does this have to do with time again? Well, taking those lofty goals and translating them into our set of requirements, what we're saying we want is a consistent timeline across replicas. Um, we want to be able to order transactions across partitions as well, and we want this order to correspond to the observed commit order. Um, if we are able to satisfy these three requirements with whatever timekeeping mechanism we choose, uh, then we obviously get the desired consistency guarantees. We also get the desired performance. Now, we're not going to go into this detail in this talk, but what it allows us to do is implement things um, like reads from replicas and consistent snapshot reads. Uh, and that's what gives us the performance that we want. All right, so let's start with the beginning, uh, with, the, with the first requirement, consistent timeline across replicas. Um, now, we're not going to talk about this because there's a protocol that we all, or several protocols that we all are, I take it, familiar with, consensus. We can use consensus protocols like Paxos and Raft, three-phase three commit, two-phase commit, what have you. We can use consensus um, to synchronously replicate um, and that would give us a consistent timeline across replicas. 
Let's talk about the second and the third properties, which are um, more interesting. What we want is we want T1 um, to be ordered before T2. Even if, T, even if T1 and T2 are across the globe. So let's think of one way to do it, uh, namely using commit timestamps. Right? The idea of a commit timestamp is when your transaction commits, you assign that version of the data. So this is, so Spanner um, uses MVCC, so it keeps around multiple versions of data. Um, so when a transaction commits, you timestamp that version of that data with that timestamp called the commit timestamp. Would that work? Well, let's see. If we had perfectly synchronized clocks, it would, right? T1 would be timestamped with 50, and T2, the transaction there, would be timestamped with 100, and, that, and then we could order them based on their timestamps, and we'd be all set. But we don't have synchronized clocks. So what else could we do? Well, if we knew exactly how, how, what the uncertainty, what the error of our clocks was, we could take that into account and still use commit timestamps. So this is what Spanner's true time does. True time is both the API and the infrastructure that provides a, what is effectively a globally synchronized clock with a bounded but non-zero error, right? So conceptually, true time both tracks and it exposes the uncertainty about perceived time across um, the system clocks. This is uh, the idea, right? So say we have an event. Um, it occurs at a time. So it occurs at an absolute time, a true time, that our system clocks cannot know. Uh, they cannot know this because of drift and because, there are, because of their error margins. But if we know the error margin, we can come up with an interval. We can come up with the bound that is guaranteed to contain true time, right? So in this case, t, the small t, is true time, um, and that represents our interval. Does this make sense so far? Cool. Um, so this is what true time does. It represents time as an interval, not a point. So for example, if you say now, true time, give me now, um, true time returns the interval that is guaranteed to contain true now. So earliest there is the earliest time that could be true now, and latest is the latest time that could be true now. So here we're talking about physical time, but it's physical time augmented with uncertainty information. Okay? So now that we have a way to know the uncertainty of our clocks, let's account for it. So what we want is for T1's commit timestamp to guaranteed be less than to T2's commit timestamp. And the way this works is, so when T1 arrives at its partition, uh, what the node does is it sets its commit timestamp uh, to be the latest time that represents now. And then it waits. It waits a full uncertainty window. And only after it waits the uncertainty window does it actually go through the commit. At that point, the changes it makes are visible to the rest of the nodes. So at that point, it commits and it replies to the client. Why does it wait? What the commit wait does is it guarantees that the next transaction will have a higher timestamp. What it, what it does is it forces um, the client to wait and therefore um, the next transaction to be serialized at least one uncertainty window ahead. Um, what this looks like in practice is now let's say T2 ends up at, its, at the second partition. Now the the node is going to assign the commit timestamp in the same way, but note that now has now moved along one whole uncertainty window. And so T2 is guaranteed to be less than T1. Um, 
Now, why do we have to wait that full uncertainty window? Because for up to that time, say, say our uncertainty window is 10. For up to 10, uh, for up to 10 milliseconds, um, there could be a, a, an error between my clock and another clock, right? So say, for example, the t T1, and so going back to our original example with the two nodes, so say that T1 ends up at a node with a slow clock, right? So it timestamps it with 50. Then, um, oh, sorry, with a fast clock. So it timestamp, uh, whoops, uh, we'll come back to it. <laughs> Time's confusing, okay. Um, all right, so, what Spanner does is, uh, so what Spanner does essentially is it waits out the uncertainty, right? So uh, it uses this concept, uh, it applies it to reads as well. Uh, we're not going to talk about reads today in the interest of time, but it applies the same idea. It knows the uncertainty window, um, and so it takes it into account to provide strong reads. Okay, so this is really, really neat, okay? This is neat because true time enables externally consistent commit timestamps, um, which in turn enables external consistency without coordination. But true time um, is not perfect, right? Um, this the uncertainty window. It affects the commit time. It affects the commit wait time, and so it affects the, the write latency, and so the throughput of the system, um, which is why you need to go through extraordinary lengths to keep this uncertainty window very small. So Google uses a lot of very expensive and very in, um, impressive infrastructure, um, and uh, it has a special clock synchronization protocol uh, to keep the clocks the system clocks very tightly synchronized, right? So whereas NTP goes up to 100 milliseconds, true time bound, binds it to seven milliseconds, which is pretty impressive. And this is also why, no, you can't have it. Uh, cool. So that's about um, true time. Now let's hop over to um, the other side of the cap theorem fence and talk about a weekly consistent store, React. Uh, have folks uh, here used React? A few, nice. Um, cool, so React is a distributed key value store. Um, so it does not support complex schemas. It's, it just maps a key to a blob. Um, and it doesn't have the notion of multi-key transactions, okay? Now, um, React chooses first and foremost to be a highly available data store. Uh, that is, it chooses to be available and able to perform reads and writes. It prioritizes that over everything else. And this, again, is important. This is an important design consideration to note. Um, to that end, the consistency guarantees React makes are very weak. It's a, the specific flavor of um, weak consistency is called eventual consistency. And the idea is replicas are allowed to diverge for a period, and they will eventually converge. Um, with an example, say we have uh, three replicas. Um, the user, uh, user comes along, and they put cart equal to A. That ends up in node one. Um, the user subsequently updates the cart to contain D, and that ends up in node two. Now, for a period, a subsequent get for the cart can return the empty cart if it ends up in, if, it, if the request is served by node three. It can, uh, the get can get a cart with value A, or it can get the cart with D. And this is totally fine. In fact, this is specified by uh, the, the consistency guarantee the system makes to you. Eventually, though, all the replicas must converge, and they must converge to the last updated value, which is the cart containing D. And this is where timekeeping comes into play, right? And our timekeeping mechanism specifically needs to be able to determine causal updates so it can converge 
uh, to the last updated value. It needs to know that D uh, was D was aware of cart A and overwrote and overwrote it. So it's causally related. Now the other thing we said we cared about um, was availability, right? So consensus is not an option here. Uh, we want not just one replica, but all replicas or many replicas to be able to accept reads and writes and perform them. And this in turn means that the second thing our timekeeping mechanism needs to be able to do is determine conflicting updates. What do I mean by conflicting updates? Well, here's an example. Well, say after user A takes the empty card and makes it card containing A, say a different user comes along and takes the empty card and makes it card containing B. Now, these two updates are effectively concurrent, right? They didn't know about each other, and therefore, and therefore they conflict. So we need the timekeeping mechanism to be able to identify updates that are causal versus conflicting. Well, let's see, can we use timestamps here? Physical timestamps? Sure, why not? Only one problem, we don't have synchronized clocks and we don't have true time. Not everybody is Google. And so we need to come up with a different timekeeping mechanism, which brings us to logical time in the form of vector clocks. Now, vector clocks are um, logical, uh, logical clocks in that they don't track physical time. Uh, they track logical time, which is entirely divorced from the idea of physical time, right? You can think of it as keeping uh, versions and uh, event counts and, and time stamping versions of the data with um, the vector clocks. Okay. Um, so this is the example we're going to be working with. We have a conflicting update. Um, so A and B are conflicting, and we have a causal update. A and D are causal. And this is the example we just discussed. Okay, so let's see how vector clocks work. Um, at the beginning of the world, so a vector clock is simply an array of n, n, count, n counters, basically, with one counter per node. Each node in the system holds on to its own vector clock to its own full vector clock. Um, at the beginning of the world, they're all set to zero. Now, each time a node observes or performs an event, it's going to increment its count in its vector clock by one. So there's a put on node one, so the zero went to one. Um, now, node three had an event, so the zero, the green zero becomes the green one. Now, node one has another event, so its vector clock goes up again. And what happens here, uh, what React does, is a get not only returns the object, the cart, it also passes along the vector clock, the timestamp, uh, in a causal context, which is really just the header of the response. Um, so it returns both the clock, um, both the clock, it whoops, both the clock and the cart. Um, now the user is going to put the cart, is going to update it to D and put it, and that's going to end up a node two, right? So that's what the user is going to do. And the user, uh, again, React does this, where the user sends along the timestamp um, that was returned to it. What this enables is causality tracking through the system. So what does node two do at this point? Well, it's just observed an event, so it's going to increment its vector clock but it's also going to do something else here. It's going to do something special to establish that it knows off the event that happened on node one. It's going to set its vector clock to the pairwise max of node one's vector clock and its vector clock. Okay, and this captures, the, captures that it knows of the other event too. All right, so this is the final state of our system and it's now time for replicas to converge. We won't talk about how replicas converge and react, but you can ask me later. Um, okay, so at replica convergence time, this, our question is, how do we know what versions of the data are causal and therefore should overwrite older versions, and what versions are conflicting and therefore should be preserved? And we're going to use vector clocks to do this. How do we do that? Well, the vector clock rule is, if X's vector clock is less than Y's vector clock, 
that x came before, happened before y. So with an example, let's look at a and d, right? Those are the associated vector clocks. If we take, um, if we do a pairwise comparison of the corresponding elements, we see that 2, 0, 0 is less than 2, 1, 0. And so cart A precedes cart D. Cart D should overwrite cart A. On the other hand, if we look at D and B, uh, we see that 2, 1, 0 is not pairwise less than 0, 0, 1. And the inverse doesn't hold as well, right? So we basically can't order the vector clocks one way or another. Um, and this means because the vector clocks can't be ordered, it means that D conflicts with B, which matches our intuition, right? So this is also pretty neat. Um, logical clocks, they give us a means to abstract away physical time and like focus on the ordering of events. So they, they are a clever proxy for physical time. Um, but logical clocks also have their pitfalls. For one, they need to be passed around to preserve that causality chain. Um, and they're divorced from physical time, right? So you can't query React um, for data based on a physical timestamp that you care about like you can do with Spanner. All right, so we could stand here and delve into the intricacies of Spanner and React all day. Um, but rather than doing that, I'd like to take a step back um, to wrap up um, and talk about what we learned today. So we first started with a discussion of why physical time doesn't quite cut it for our disputed systems. We then looked at um, two very different approaches used by two very different systems to get around this problem, right? We talked about true time and how it augments physical clocks, uh, no, how it augments physical time with this uncertainty information um, to give us timestamps that correspond to the wall clock time, but to give us external consistency. We then talked about a radically different approach to the problem of physical time. We talked about doing away with physical time entirely and, and, and coming up with this notion of logical time um, tracked by vector clocks. And this gives us a means to track causal relations and not worry about time at all, like physical time at all. But these approaches are not perfect. Right, true time requires a globally synchronized clock in order to work, um, and vector clocks uh, don't have anything to do with physical time. Uh, which brings us to an idea that I will have to leave you with, um, or I'm happy to talk about later, um, which is hybrid logical clocks used by CockroachDB. It's a fairly new technology, and what it does is it bridges the gap um, between physical time and logical time. Um, it's pretty cool, and I encourage uh, you to check that. Um, but we are about out of time. Uh, I hope you leave today um, with an understanding of the timekeeping mechanisms used by these two systems specifically, but, uh, but more importantly, perhaps, an appreciation for the, the nuances of the problem of timekeeping in our systems. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.